Thank you for joining us for our Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar on the role of nutrition for cancer patients. When diagnosed with cancer, nutrition becomes even more important. Good nutrition can help you feel better, reduce the risk of infection, keep your strength up, and help you heal faster. During this informational webinar, you will learn the building blocks of a healthy diet as well as the nutritional needs throughout treatment. I am Mary Margaret Kilmeyer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am the patient resource manager for Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and currently completing my doctorate. My clinical and research background is focused on working collaboratively with doctors, patients, their families, and members of a healthcare team. We would like to thank Genentech for providing funding to make this webinar possible. We would also like to thank our promotional partners, the American Association for Cancer Research, the Anti-Cancer Club, Cure Magazine, the Esophageal, Esophageal Cancer Action Network, Meals to Heal, and Patient Resource. You will be able to ask questions during this presentation. You can type your question into the white text box that appears on your screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will address questions as time allows. If we don't have time to address your question, we will try to address it during our next webinar, taking place on May 6th at 12 noon Eastern Time. In addition, the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in approximately one week. Now I will introduce Zephy Zellman, who will share with you her journey and information about Debbie's Dream Foundation. Then Margaret Martin will present the role of nutrition for cancer patients. And then there will be a question and answer session at the end. I would now like to introduce the president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation, Debbie Zellman. Thank you so much, Mary Margaret. And it's a pleasure to have everyone on this call. Thank you. So I'm the president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. I was diagnosed with stage 4 stomach cancer in April of 2008 when I was only 40 years old. I had three little kids and I was married to a physician as well as being a practicing attorney with my own firm. I had no risk factors for stomach cancer and my symptoms were very vague. I was told that the chances of me being alive in five years was only 4%. In April of 2009, I founded Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. However, I am still a cancer patient. I do receive chemo every three weeks by IV as well as take an oral um, medication every night. I serve as patient advocate on many committees, including the National Cancer Institute Esophageal Gastric Task Force, the NCCN Gastric and Esophageal Guidelines Committee, the Department of Defense Peer Review Cancer Research Program Integration Panel, the ASCO HER2 Testing in Gastric Cancer Project, and on the NCI Patient Advocacy Steering Committee. The organization is also a member of the Deadliest Cancers Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. Most notably, I'm told, however, I appeared on Dr. Oz in an episode about stomach cancer. Next slide, please. So here are a few facts about stomach cancer. It is one of the leading causes of cancer death worldwide, second in men and fourth in women. Each year, nearly 930,000 people are worldwide are diagnosed with stomach cancer and approximately 700,000 will die. More than 24,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer each year and more than 11,000 will die that year. Unfortunately, stomach cancer is on the rise now in young people ages 25 to 39. And per cancer death, stomach cancer receives the least amount of federal funding of any cancer. There were few resources and support services available for stomach cancer patients when I was diagnosed, and most people knew very little about this deadly disease. Next slide. So what are we doing, Debbie's Dream? We are trying to solve many of those problems. Our mission as a nonprofit organization is dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support internationally for patients, families, and caregivers with the ultimate goal to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. Our website is www.debbystream.org. We have reached many milestones as an organization. Thank you, next slide. <laughs> um, we have in-depth stomach cancer information on our lecture library, our clinical trials information and matching service, our stomach cancer support community. We have blog topics 
and resources which are completely translatable into more than 60 languages. We have a free patient resource education program called PrEP, which helps hundreds of patients, families, and caregivers throughout the world. And it matches an inquirer with another stomach cancer survivor or caregiver using specific disease criteria like stage, uh, age, uh, biomarker, region, et cetera. We offer a free stomach cancer education symposium each year, as well as free webinars like this one. We have 24 chapters in the United States, Canada, and Germany, and are continuing to expand every day. We hold events across the United States, and we have funded $150,000 toward research grants. We also are very strong advocates on a national level for stomach cancer. We have held three Capitol Hill Advocacy Days and the first ever Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Briefing. We have been so successful that we were able to add stomach cancer to a $50 million pot of money called the Department of Defense Peer Review Cancer Research Program. Next slide, please. This is a little snapshot of our homepage of our website. It's a very easily navigable website, and we would encourage all of you to go onto the website and look at all of the resources that we have. Next slide. We also have many events, all like I said, all across the country. And here are some upcoming events, including um, a basketball game in Ohio, our symposium, and our gala that we hold each year in Fort Lauderdale on April 18th. International Stomach Cancer Genes Day, which can take place anywhere in the world on November 13th, and that is held annually, as well as a marathon and half marathon in Miami in January. Next slide. And now I'm going to turn the presentation back over to our wonderful moderator, Mary Margaret Kilmeyer. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Debbie. Debbie's Dream Foundation is headquartered in Davie, Florida. Our office is open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. On this slide, you will also see important phone numbers and email addresses to contact our office. We will now start the presentation on the role of nutrition for the cancer patient. Our presenter is Margaret Martin of ProPoint Cancer Support. Margaret Martin is a licensed dietitian and nutritionist in the state of Tennessee, as well as a certified diabetes educator. She graduated from the University of Alabama with a Bachelor of Science in Dietetics and received her master's degree in Nutrition Science and Public Health from the University of Tennessee. With more than 10 years of experience in clinical nutrition, Margaret also has worked with the insurance industry, providing nutrition consultations, service assistance, and nutrition education. In her free time, Margaret volunteers with the American Lung Association's annual Lung Force Walk in Middle Tennessee. She belongs to the Oncology, Nutrition, and Diabetes Care and Education Dietetic Practice Groups of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I would now like to turn the webinar over to Margaret Martin. Thank you so much, Mary Margaret and Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I wanted to thank our uh, participants today, survivors, caregivers, maybe some health care providers as well. Today we're going to talk about nutrition, take a bite into a powerful tool during stomach cancer. Next slide. Our goals today for our webinar are threefold. Um, well, first, I should say I have no disclosures. Next slide. <clears throat> I do work with Pearl Point Cancer Support. We're a nonprofit organization that has the mission to provide a more confident cancer journey for adults anytime, anywhere. We bring more than 27 years of experience serving patients, caregivers, and supporting health care providers. And our service is online, personalized, and free. Next slide. We do have a website where most of our information is located, of course. It's called My Pearl Point. If you visit our website, please go ahead and create a profile or a dashboard. That way you'll be able to see the information that you're most interested in. We have topics such as cancer edu education, research, nutrition, and living with cancer. It is written on a fourth to sixth grade uh, reading level to appeal to a wide variety of folks. Also, we've added a new series called Eat to Fight videos concerning nutrition. So after the webinar, please visit our website, mypowerpoint.org. Thank you. Next slide. Also, we have a 
Side Effects Helper app for your smartphone. You can download it free. You can see some quick tips on managing side effects such as nausea, weight loss, and change in taste and smell. And it's easy to use, especially if you're experiencing a side effect. So just go to the iTunes or Google Play Store to download the free app. Next slide. All right, today's goals for our webinar are three. First of all, let's think about how food works in our body. Next, we're going to learn how the stomach, uh, how stomach cancer changes your nutritional needs. And most importantly, see some strategies to help you cope with the nutritional side effects of stomach cancer. Next slide. Now looking at this cartoon, um, the vendor is telling the shopper, of course donuts are good for you. They're whole grain, whole being spelled H-O-L-E. So there is more to food than meets the eye. So let's first look at what food does for you. Next slide. <coughs> Food has many functions in our body. The basic functions, of course, are for energy, uh, for stamina, growth as we go through life, and also for repair. Next slide. As we continue through life, especially in the world of cancer, uh, we think about the, most, uh, the more complex jobs of food, which is immunity or the ability to fight disease and infection. Also, Good nutrition is important for thinking, to have good cognitive skills for reasoning, viewing, and making decisions. Next slide. Also in the world of stomach cancer, we also think of food as being one of the main um, areas of concern during cancer treatment. The goal of healthy food during cancer treatment is to help you complete all your treatments on time which yields the best result scenario. Next slide. So let's look a little bit about what food does as a healthy building block for life. Our, our body needs fuel and activity to work together to be healthy. As you see, food and activity and health are very interrelated and interdependent. Next slide. <clears throat> when we think of food and fluids, Actually, there are more than 50 nutrients that an adult may need for health and wellness. Um, there are about five food groups, and fluids are, of course, a part of the healthy foods. Next slide. When we eat healthily, we're able to be physically active. Uh, many health and physical activity fitness organizations recommend at least 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week or maybe more. We also call aerobic exercise cardiac exercise. That's things like walking, swimming, um, doing vigorous yard work, <coughs> biking, dancing. Another type of activity would be strength. Strength helps build muscle or maintain muscle mass, which is very important during treatment as well. Uh, the third type of activity might be thought of as flexibility exercise. Flexibility exercise helps us maintain our range of motion and can also help a little bit with our balance. And very important during treatment is stress control. Activity can help you control stress, good or bad stress, and help you reframe the way you look at stress during cancer treatment. Next slide. So together, food activity uh, helps build good strength during cancer treatment. And that means strength for our daily life tasks, like dressing, cooking, making our medical appointments. Health gives us strength uh, for vitality, for a positive outlook, maintaining um, interactions with people that matter with us. Health can also help support a good immunity system and, of course, reduce your risk for future cancer recurrence. Next slide. Now let's get in a little bit to think about a visual of how your nutrition may change over time with, your, with respect to your stomach cancer journey. Next slide. 
if we think about the first phase, that might be for your diagnosed with stomach cancer. You may have your typical food and activity level. You may have few or no nutrition limits. Um, that means if you had anything related to your uh, otherwise health, like hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, you may have some food restrictions related to that, but maybe not any related to stomach. Uh, you may have few or no symptoms of stomach cancer. Next slide. At time of diagnosis, you may have developed at that time maybe altered digestion. Possibly you might not have uh, been able to eat the same foods or have regularity in your digestion. Um, you might have had some limited food at, at intake based on those altered digestion needs. Um, through time, at time of diagnosis, you might also have a change in your nutritional needs. Um, often with stomach cancer, one symptom can be weight loss, so you might need more protein and more calories to maintain a healthy weight. Now let's look at treatment. Next slide. During treatment, your nutritional needs will most definitely probably change. Uh, during treatment, Good cells are broken down through radiation and chemotherapy, so most people need additional protein to help rebuild the healthy cells. Uh, due to the location of stomach cancer, you may also have a need to change your meal size and food types that you eat. Instead of having three big meals a day, you might find that's no longer a possibility. Also, your flu uh, Fluid and concentrated sugars um, intakes of those may change for comfort and to be able to absorb your foods well. And also do, during treatment, your lifestyle, where you eat, uh, how often you eat out or with friends may change as well. Next slide. Now we'll think about survivorship. Some people think about survivorship uh, occurring after your treatments are completed. Um, so we'll use that definition for our seminar today. During survivorship, it's recommended to maintain a heart-healthy menu. Also, to continue to time your food and fluid intake to meet your, um, if you've had surgery or changes in your digestive tract due to cancer. And you might find it's better to use foods that are high in nutrition density, in other words, have a lot of nutrition for each bite. And that helps you maintain your vitality and reduce risk of future cancer reoccurrence. Next slide. Now for our focus today, although there are many side effects with stomach cancer and treatment, today we're going to focus on four different nutritional needs. Uh, what would be your protein need? How will your meal types change? your fluid needs, and any change in lifestyle that you might find necessary. Next slide. Now thinking first about protein needs. Protein needs often are increased after surgery. Um, and if you're taking any treatments, chemotherapy or radiation treatments, that might also trigger a change in your protein needs. Um, have you changed the amount of meat or dairy that you're eating? And do you have any chewing, dental, or swallowing issues that may prevent eating your usual menus? Well, let's look at some strategies that will help address these. Next slide. Protein, of course, is a building block of our body. Typically, um, as adults, we might just need 56 grams of protein a day before any disease or special condition. But with cancer, you might find you need to eat protein with each meal or snack, or about five to six times a day. To help keep your appetite high, do vary your sources of protein. There are many other than meat, but meat, poultry, and fish are the most well-known. We also can get protein from dried beans and peas called lentils, nuts and nut butters, dairy products, eggs, cheese, soy products, protein, and milk powders. 
Also now, some breakfast cereals are even fortified with protein. If your appetite is less, you can also add protein into some of the favorite foods you're already eating. That's a main recommendation you'll often hear during cancer treatment is you don't have to use a lot of special foods, just try to adapt the foods that you enjoy. Some ideas might be to stir protein into popsicles, smoothies, and gelatins. They're tasteless, odorless, and colorless protein uh, products that are out there commercially that you can simply slip into popsicles, smoothies, and gelatin. Uh, if you enjoy more hot foods, you can also add protein into casserole, soups, mashed potatoes, as well as different wraps and sandwich foods. It can be regular chopped protein, uh, like shredded meat, um, tuna, or you can use protein powders or milk, dry milk powder as well. If you drink between your meals, which is often recommended, um, to stir a little protein into your tea, your water, or any other beverage you're having. Many of the pro products, like uh, protein are tasteless and odorless, so you can use them all day and really taste or see them. Next slide. All right. Um, thinking about your personal protein needs, each one of us has an individual protein need, depending on where you are on your cancer journey and any other health concerns you may have. Typically, one way to know what your protein baseline is, is to take your body weight, divide it by 2.2, and that gives you the number of grams you might need. If you're healing after surgery or after treatment, during treatment, you might need to add extra grams to that. If your kidneys aren't healthy, you may have to subtract grams of protein. So be sure to ask your health care team for your personal protein goal. Next slide. Now, shifting gears a little bit, let's think about where we can get protein naturally from the foods we enjoy. Uh, if you think about an ounce of meat, that might have seven grams. An egg might have six. And you can go through the chart and see about different animal proteins. Also, vegetable and soy proteins have great, uh, soy foods have great or carry nice amounts of protein. So try to spread your protein out through the day and use a variety so you won't get uh, fatigued with the flavors. Next slide. All right. Now shifting gears, we've talked a little bit about how to meet your changing protein needs. Now let's think about how you can meet your meal modifications. How do you know if you might need to have a change in your meal style? Well, some questions to ask yourself might be, have you had uh, stomach or digestive tract surgery in the recent past? Or possibly, is less food filling you up quickly? Or do you often experience bloating, cramping, and diarrhea? These can be some signs that you might need to modify your meal style. Next slide. Of course, if you've had stomach surgery um, or stomach removal, a gastrectomy, you've lost part of your or the total large digestive function of your body. So instead of having a stomach that's about the size of a fist, or when it was full, it might hold 44 ounces, you might have just a small pouch or no stomach at all. So to decrease the risk of diarrhea and cramping, plan to have at least five to six small meals a day. When we eat small meals, our body is more efficient. It's able to get more of the digestion done in the small intestine and large intestine to release the nutrition you need. Think small. Since your stomach might be compromised or removed, think about small portions, two ounces, a third cup serving, a half a slice, or a tablespoon of food. That way your body will be more efficient in digesting it. Go soft. If you are recently have had stomach surgery, you might still be in phase one. So phase one nutritional recommendations include dry meals, soft foods, low fat, low spice. Um, relax at meals. Chew each bite well. 
digestion really starts in our mouth. So if you're able to chew well and mix food with your uh, saliva, that's a great way to get your digestion started early. If you do find you're having dental issues, do stay in touch with your dentist often and let them know what's going on. Of course, choose low fat, low sugar items. Fat can be very hard to digest. Sugar may, in salty foods, may draw a lot of fluid into your digestive tract and cause cramping and diarrhea. So go slow on the sugar and the fat. In phase two, add back food slowly. If you're not having symptoms like diarrhea or cramping, add back one food at a time. Keep a food log or side effects tracker with your food intake and any symptoms you might have after that new food. And share those symptoms and foods with your healthcare team. Thank you. Next slide. Also, thinking about modifying your meals, um, we did just talk a little bit about the side effects tracker. Um, if you do experience diarrhea, use more soluble fibers. Soluble fibers, most notably, we heard about it in, if you know of the BRAT diet, which is banana, rice, plain toast, applesauce, and tea. Um, soluble fibers help slow down diarrhea. They actually form a nice gel around your bowel movement and let it move at the right pace through your uh, small and large intestines. And that's opposed with insoluble fibers, which are, can be very irritating, like peels, nuts, seeds, whole grains. They can irritate the lining of your digestive tract, cause it to be inflamed, and instead of being an inch and a half in diameter, it might just be a fourth or half an inch, and that can cause constipation in some people, and then diarrhea. Try to include protein with each meal. Protein can help make your digestive absorption more efficient. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of protein. It might just be a little protein with some crackers or fruit at a snack. It could be two to three ounces of meat at a meal, or it could be a smoothie or a milkshake that you've added extra protein to. Now, if you're at risk for dumping syndrome or rapid diarrhea, avoid these foods if the first three ingredients on the food label are honey, sugar, corn syrup, fructose, lactose, dextrose, or sugar alcohols like sorbitol. Sugar alcohols end in OL, and they, like real sugar, can cause your body to put a lot of fluid in your digestive tract, and that often can trigger diarrhea. This is most frequently experienced during the first phase after gastrectomy, maybe 6 to 8 to 12 weeks. Next slide. All right, so we've looked a little bit at protein needs, changing your meals. Now let's look at do you need to change your fluid intake? If you answered uh, yes to experiencing diarrhea after meals, you could be at risk for fluid changes. Has your weight decreased without a known reason? And does the nausea occur quickly after eating? Next slide. We don't really think a lot about what we drink or when we drink it or how much until we have um, cancer or surgery for cancer, especially a gastrectomy. If you've had a gastrectomy, please uh, think about when you're going to drink your fluids. Often during phase one, right after surgery, it's suggested to drink fluids 30 to 60 minutes before or after meals. This gives your body time to absorb the liquid and the nutrition from it, and then you're able to eat solid food at your next sitting. Um, since your meals will be mostly what we might call dry meals, you're not going to have a beverage or just a sip of beverage to help you swallow. Pair your foods with less tender items, such as you could pair meat and vegetables with a side of applesauce, unsweetened, or maybe some canned light fruit, yogurt, or cooked cereals. The moisture from this food, from these one of these foods, could help you um, 
be able to chew and swallow and enjoy your meal better without a beverage at it. In addition, you can put gravies, sauces, and spreads on your food items to provide a little moisture as well. If you think you're becoming lactose sensitive, try to limit milk and explore other non-dairy milks. What is lactose sensitivity? Well, that might mean if you use a, a beverage like milk that has lactose in it and you experience cramping or dumping diarrhea afterwards, you probably are developing some lactose sensitivity. So try some other lactose-free milks or soy milk or almond milk. Next slide. Now fluids are important to help you um, digest your food well and they also carry um, the enzymes to help you digest your foods. But often we don't think about what fluids are outside of our glass. So foods that might be considered fluids might also be thought of as soups, ice cream, gelatins, uh, puddings, and some desserts that might have those items in them as well. So you might want to pair those with a snack or between meals or after meal. When thinking about fluids, go decaffeinated. Decaffeinated fluids and beverages work much better because often caffeine can cause um, a slight level of dehydration or low hydration. Go slow on high sugar drinks or concentrated sugars in drinks. Um, so if you usually love fruit juice, you might have to go with the, the light juices or simply uh, dilute them with a little water. And if you experience uh, cramping after eating with hot foods, try room temperature or cooled fluids. They tend to stimulate less gastric movement or intestinal movement, and you might find you'll absorb your food better. So the main premise around the fluid adaptations is being able to absorb the food and fluid you do eat. If you're having rapid diarrhea, you're not absorbing your calories, your nutrition that you need for health and to complete your treatment. So the goal is to have good absorption and enjoy your meals. Next slide. Okay. What about lifestyle? What does that have to do with nutrition and stomach cancer? Well, let's consider these questions. Are you in a rush at meals? Do you eat away from home often? Has your strength for daily activities declined? And have you skipped reading the food labels for some of the high-risk ingredients? These are red flags that you might need a lifestyle adjustment. Next slide. Thinking about lifestyle, we might really think of that more as in terms of how do you eat? What is the manner in which you eat? Uh, do you eat on the run, rushed, um, or do you take time to enjoy your meal? Um, if you are more into the enjoyment of the meal, that's the best answer. Try to take time to eat. Allow 30, at least 30 to 45 minutes to eat and chew your food well so you can absorb your healthy nutrients. Make mealtime pleasant and calm. Uh, it's not a time to argue or if you're a caregiver to try to bring up idea, um, complaints about what people eat, make it a pleasant and happy time so their digestion uh, can be complete. If you're experiencing a poor appetite or decline in your appetite, eat with friends to help stimulate a healthy thought and appetite. Uh, turn off any distractions like digital devices and TVs at mealtime and turn on the conversation. That way you can identify happy times with what you're eating. Use smaller lunch size plates and cups because your meal size might be about half or a third of what it might used to have been before cancer or cancer treatment. And after your food is digested, do try to plan some physical activity. Uh, physical activity helps stimulate normal digestion and movement of food through your digestive tract. So be active when you feel good and if your physician allows that. Next slide. 
Also thinking about lifestyle, if you go out quite often, change how you order food. Think about ordering maybe from the appetizer menu or the child's menu. Often the portion sizes might be smaller. Ask for a to-go box early in your meal or when you order your food so that if you're only going to have half of a meal, you can box up the other half quickly. Or if you're out with friends, share an entree with a friend. Go for the small beverage size. In a lot of restaurants now, we have small, medium, large. So go, go small so you can save your beverage to just sip on during your meal or after you eat. Look for those key words on the menu like baked, steamed, broiled, or stir-fried. These are usually lower fat and tender food cookery. Instead of using sugar in your food when you go out, try using the sugar substitutes in the colored packages. Next slide. All right, so we've looked at four side effects of, of stomach cancer and treatment. Where could you get more nutrition information? Well, we do recommend that you use websites that are evidence-based, um, such as mypearlpoint.org. We have videos, blogs, articles, and webinars that you can use. Uh, of course, excellent website is debbiesdream.org. Uh, Choosemyplate.gov helps you evaluate what you're eating and also gives you some suggestions for healthy people. Uh, with cancer diagnoses, of course, the American Cancer Society and the Amer American Institute for Cancer Research both have excellent websites as well, as does the National Cancer Institute. If you've lost more than five pounds, five to 10 pounds without a reason, or are unable to eat healthily, ask your healthcare team for a referral to a registered dietitian who specializes in nutrition. If you want to find one on your own, you can go to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics website, which is eatright.org, and look at find an expert. The practice group for cancer nutrition specialist is called Oncology Nutrition, and they also have a feature to help you find a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in cancer. Great. Well, that completes our nutrition portion, and I'll now turn it back over to Mary Margaret. But I do want to encourage you to improve your outcome by choosing healthy nutrition at every stage of your cancer journey. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. That was a very valuable and informative presentation, and we, we do appreciate you. Uh, what I will do now is go ahead and start to read some of the questions that we have received during the presentation, um, as time allows. The, the first question, because of the chemo I am on, it gives me bad diarrhea. I am not able to eat many fruits and vegetables. My digestive tract can really only handle protein and starch, and I am able to maintain my weight. Is this okay? Well, that's a good question. Um, so it sounds like she's, she or he is not able to tolerate fruits. Um, one suggestion might be to try just a small portion of fruit, like a tablespoon or two. Um, you can also speak to your healthcare team about any dietary supplements that might help you get the nutrients from fruits. Um, so one idea is to eat small um, or speak with your healthcare team about replacing those nutrients. There are nutrients that are in the vegetable family that are similar to fruits, like vitamin C and tomatoes and things of that nature. So it might be, you might be able to do a crossover over to a similar food that might have similar nutrients. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do drinks like Peptamin work? My dad weighs 100 pounds and has been put on Peptamin. However, he gets very sick after having it. Are there other alternatives? OK, well, Peptamin is a very um, individualized supplement that's available by doctor's prescription. Um, Often, if you're having diarrhea or if you can't tolerate it, 
you may have to dilute it and just use one or two ounces at a time. And um, you might have to use a, ask your doctor rather, about a nutritional supplement that's lower in carbohydrate and simple sugars. Um, there are those available, but work, it's best to work with your physician's office on that. Thank you so much. Uh, as you know, this webinar was brought to you by Debbie's Dream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer. Thank you to Debbie Selman, President and Founder, our speaker, Margaret Martin from Pole Point Cancer Support for collaborating not only on this webinar but others in the past as well as other projects, and to Genentech for providing funding that helped make this webinar possible. As you see on your screen, we have upcoming events to get involved in and support. Details about these events are available on the Debbie's Dream website at www.debbiesdream.org. Thank you to all of our listeners today. Our next nutrition webinar will be held on May 6th at 12 noon Eastern Time. We would love to hear your feedback, questions, and comments before then. Please send your comments to patient.resource at debbiesdream.org. Please stay tuned for our clinical trials webinar, which will be starting momentarily.